in case you have not yet noticed, your bishop believes in the power of prayer. And so as we are going to be delivering this State of the Church Address, I've asked some folks to undergird this address with their prayers. Let me reassure you that the United Methodist Church in Western Pennsylvania is doing well, and each day it is going on to be perfected in love. We have much to smile about because in the midst of the distractions and discouragements of this world, God keeps breaking through, keeps breaking through our churches with signs of hope and it is on that hope that we stand. United Methodist Communications is doing a series of, of podcasts, interviews, designed to help the church to, to get to know the faith stories of newly elected bishops. Joe Iovino recently posted the interview that he did with me. The posting shows a picture that was taken right after my service of consecration as a bishop. In that picture, I'm smiling. I'm smiling because I'm flanked with members of this annual conference. Last week, I posted that picture on my Facebook page with this caption, it's been two years and we're still smiling together. Over the past year, I've traveled all around this annual conference and, and have witnessed how, how God is moving. I have, I have much much to smile about. I continue to feel blessed, humbled, and privileged to serve as the Bishop of the Western Pennsylvania Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. So in case your hope is waning, in case your smile has been slipping away, let me assure you that in the Western Pennsylvania Annual Conference, God is still on the throne. And the name of Jesus still works here. As I have traveled across I-86 and I-70, as I have driven up and down I-79 and across I-80, as, as I have even been up and down and across I-70, 376, as I have traversed I-90, I have heard the stories and seen with my own eyes that God has been using you to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. God has been using you to, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I've heard stories and witnessed ways in which God has been using you to feed the hungry, to give the thirsty a cold water, follow water to drink, to welcome the stranger, to, to clothe the naked, to, to care for the sick, and to visit those in prison. I have heard the stories of the signs and wonders that our God has displayed among us. I've heard stories of miraculous healings and unexplainable blessings. I've ministered with you and uh, among you, and I've personally, personally experienced the, the movement of the Holy Spirit in such a way that my life has been transformed and the lives of those around us have been transformed too. Yes, in the Western Pennsylvania Annual Conference, the church is doing well, and every day we are going on to be perfected in love. Witnessing the Holy Spirit over this past year has given me a lot of hope. 
And I am convinced, your bishop is convinced that God is still with us and that we can expect that God will continue to be with us. So that's why I'm dressed the way I'm dressed. I'm dressed in hope because I've seen what God can do. But I, I must admit that as I have traveled throughout this annual conference, even in the midst of your smiles and my hope and the powerful work of God, I have seen that there are forces in this world and unfortunately in our church that are trying to discourage us and steal our hope. There are forces that are trying to, to turn our frowns upside down and change our garments of hope into garments of mourning clothes. And I must admit that there are times throughout this past year that I've heard from, from some of you words of disappointment, words of, of despair and anxiety and, and fear and anger. I've heard from some of you words of hopelessness about our beloved denomination. And frankly, throughout this past year, there have been some times that I've been there with you. I've been disappointed. I've been anxious. I've been fearful. And I've even been angry. But miraculously, this is why I know you've been praying for me. Miraculously, when I have been at my lowest points as a bishop, God has shown up. When I have been at my lowest points as your bishop, God has pointed something out to me inevitably something happens to remind me that God is still on the throne and that in this region the name of Jesus still works. In those moments when I've been tempted to, to give in to my fears and anxiety and I've been tempted to become hopeless, God has reminded me that God did not give me a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Through God's grace, I experienced the words of 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 9 that say, I was afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. And I've lived into the words of Paul. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we boast in our suffering knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that's been given to each one of us. In those moments, God has reminded me that, that my hope isn't built on the situation that I see around me. But my hope, my hope is built on nothing less 
than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand because all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. This is what our hope is built on. We who are followers of the one for whom the grave was empty, we live by faith not by sight. And thanks to, to all of your prayers, God convicted me the devil is a liar. God convicted me that my hope is to remind the people of the hope that we have that does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts. My job is to boast in the hope of the sharing of the glory of God. And so my task here today is to, in fact, acknowledge the places of our despair, the places of our disappointment, our anxiety, our, our fear, and our anger, and to point us to a greater reality, to the eternal hope that is ours through Jesus Christ. My task today is, that, is to make sure that we're not standing on shifting sand, but rather on the solid rock. As I have moved around this annual conference, I've heard some of your despair about the challenges that we have in developing principled Christian leaders. You know that as an annual conference, we voted that we would focus on that, on developing principled Christian leaders, yet in some ways we have struggled in this area. I've heard from you, from many of you, a desire to be more effective leaders, and so you want some more effective leadership training. You want to be better prepared for the leadership roles that you take on in the church. I heard that, that many of you as, as leaders want to know more about what's happening in this conference, what's happening in our denomination, and I acknowledge that these are areas on which we need to work. We also need to work on our conference level committee participation. There are times when there are conference level committee meetings at the annual conf at the conference center and only half the people who are members of the committee show up. There are times when the nominations committee has to call several people before they get a yes, someone who's willing to serve on a committee. And I get discouraged. I get discouraged when we complain about the conference, and yet it's hard to get people to volunteer to serve on the committees that make decisions about the ministries of the conference. Let me confess to you that I get discouraged when our leaders, either laity or clergy, who behave in ways that belie their Christian witness. Most of our churches in this annual conference are in small, intimate communities. And so most people in the community, they know who goes to the United Methodist Church. And so if leaders in our church are behaving badly in the community, we mar our Christian witness and we, through our behavior, lie about who God is and who God has been to us. This past year, it hurt my heart 
to hear that a member of the community, not one of our church folks, would not become involved in one of the community ministries of one of our churches because she didn't want to work with one of the church leaders. She said of this leader, and I quote, he's just mean. It hurt me to my heart when one of our church leaders voiced a number of racist and sexist comments. It hurts my heart when we live below our Christian witness. So here's what I'm gonna to pledge to do. I'm gonna pledge that I'm gonna hold pastors and laity who are in positions of leadership accountable to behave in ways that are consistent with our Christian witness. I believe in grace, so I'm always going to be willing to provide support and encouragement to our leaders so that they get the emotional and spiritual, psychological and professional support that they need to make better choices. But if they don't avail themselves of that support, or if that support doesn't help them to make better choices, then the grace that I'm gonna extend will take a different form. Because sometimes grace means removing a person from a situation where they continue to harm themselves or others. Let me also confess that I've been discouraged by the fact that some members of the United Methodist Church here in Western Pennsylvania do not know what it is to be United Methodist. More often than I would like, I've encountered members who don't know the basics, basics, I'm not talking about deep theological scholarship, the basics of our theology, our doctrine, and our polity. For example, you heard me say it here last year, but I still encountered it over this year. For example, they don't know that the Bible is the, that we believe the Bible is the inspired word of God, not the inerrant word of God. Lay and clergy alike don't seem to know our social principles. And, and people don't understand that the appointment system applies to all clergy who serve in the United Methodist Church regardless of the size of the church. We have United Methodists that don't know what it is to be United Methodist. And as your bishop, I take responsibility for that. That's my responsibility. And so I apologize to you for that. We have not trained our leaders well. We have not communicated well. And we have not been consistent in our enforcement of the Book of Discipline. My bad. It's no wonder that in some places around our annual conference, I've encountered frustration with our denomination. Now, admittedly, some of the frustration is due to our current impasse regarding the role of practicing homosexuals in the life of our church. But some of the frustration is due to or compounded by the fact that some folks were allowed to join a denomination they didn't really know. I've witnessed from some of you frustration because you believe that some United Methodists have been allowed to violate the Book of Discipline without consequence. Please know that if any of you know of any instance where the Book of Discipline has been violated, each of you has a right to file a written complaint. Also know that in all of the instances that folks raised with me where they thought the Book of Discipline was not being enforced, that it had been violated without consequence, the Book of Discipline had in fact been enforced in those cases. This is gonna be hard to hear. But just because you do not believe that the consequence for the violation was severe enough, that doesn't mean that the Book of Discipline was not enforced. 
Our polity provides for a process for people who file charges and those for whom charges have been filed against. In that process, we don't get to decide what happens to a clergy person or a lay person or even a bishop in another jurisdiction. Just as no one outside of this annual conference, except for the judicial council, gets to decide what happens to our lay or clergy persons who violate the Book of Discipline. That is our polity. That is who we are as United Methodist. Now I admit that by world, the world standards, that you and I have sufficient evidence to, discourage, to be discouraged regarding our ability to develop principled leaders. But let me point you to some signs of hope. Let me boast for just a moment in the glory of God. We've been trying to make some changes at our conference level committees so that our training events and our, our committee meetings are more laity friendly. And so in order to do that, we've been scheduling the meetings outside of work hours and we've been using technology so that people don't have to travel four hours round trip to attend a two hour meeting. When I consulted with the Johnstown District Committee on Superintendency to let them know who their new district superintendent was going to be, we did it via conference call. One of the elders of our village who's on that committee admitted that, that she was a little nervous about meeting via conference call. You see, she'd never done it that way before. And so she had someone help her to make that call. But at the conclusion of the call, she thanked me for making it easy for her to participate and to meet. There is hope. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our reality that is that in the midst of our, our challenges, we have been developing principled Christian leaders. For the past seven years, the, the Erie Meadville District has focused on developing intentional disciple-making systems. Hilltop. UMC in the Greensburg District is using technology such as video games and, and live newscasting to teach Bible stories to, to children and youth. The Monongahela UMC in the Washington District has a discipleship training program for adults which teaches them to make disciples while they, while they themselves are growing in their own discipleship. The Connorsville District held an evangelism training event entitled, See All the People. And I call your attention to those leaders who we as an annual conference have given an award for their leadership in various areas of ministry. You will find their names and the reason that they won the award in the booklet that is in your packet called Annual Conference Awards. I'm standing on the solid rock because I'm talking about the hope. We've also been blessed to have many members of this annual conference elected to serve throughout our connection. Now, I'm gonna get ready to call out their names and I know when I call the names, you're gonna wanna erupt in thunderous applause to praise God, but please hold your applause until I've called all of their names because there are a lot of them. Sharon Gregory is president of the Association of Conference Lay Leaders. Reverend Bald Zilhaver serves on the General Commission on the Status and Role of, of Women. Reverend William Meekins is on the Board of Trustees at Gammon Theological Seminary and the General Church Connectional Table. Donna Visa serves on the General Board of Church and Society. Andrew Chung, one of our youth, serves on the General Board of Global Ministries. Reverend Alice Weaver Dunn and Reverend Tracy Cox serve on the General Commission on Communication. Reverend Thomas Parkinson is, one of the general, is on the General Board of Pensions. McKenna Kentz is also one of our youths is on the Division of Young People. Again, Reverend Alice Weaver Dunn and, and, Reverend, and Peggy Ward serve on the NEJ Vision Table. Kirsten Kennedy and Sung Chik Chung serve on the NEJ Rules Committee. Vicki Stallman is one of the NEJ Program and Arrangements Committee persons. 
Sharon Gregory again and Bob Zillhaver again are on the NHA Episcopacy Committee. Molly Landman and, and Reverend Stephanie Gutchalk are on the NHA Boundaries Committee. Alice Weaver Dunn's a busy woman. She serves on the NHA Committee on Appeals. <laughs> and Tracy Merrick is the alternate to that committee. Y'all know William Meeks is a busy man too. He's on the committee, the NEJ Committee on Investigations. Jack Piper and Naomi Horner are on the NEJ Commission on Archives and History. And finally, in August, two of our youth, Molly Landman will be the president of the NEJ Council on Youth Ministry, and Ali Ben will be their Youth Service Fund Chair. I'd like those persons, if you're present, will you please stand so that we might praise God for you. I want you to know that we're blessed, that we're standing on solid rock, because the members of this annual conference are having an impact on our denomination. The members of this annual conference are making decisions about the ministries and the, and the direction of the United Methodist Church. So indeed, there is hope as we continue to develop principled Christian leaders. Adam Stump is now going to lead us in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are the one who took fishermen and men and women of ill repute, tax collectors, Pharisees, publicans, sinners, and you took them out of what they were and turned them into game changers and world shapers by the power of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. God, I pray that we would be faithful in doing the same thing through the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray that we would not look at others with human eyes upon their outward appearance, but I pray that we would see as God sees and that we would look at their hearts. I am thankful for the leadership of this conference the leadership that is obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit, wherever that wind might take us, dear God, may we be faithful to follow. And I pray, dear Lord, that as we raise up a new generation of leaders, whether they are elders or deacons, whether they are lay speakers or lay servants, whether they are sitting in pews or preaching in pulpits, I pray, dear God, that we would do our part as shepherds of the flock of God, that we would equip them for all good work for the gospel of Jesus Christ and that we would arm them with the weapons of our warfare which are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. I pray, dear Lord, that our leaders would be anointed with power from on high so that the name of Jesus may be proclaimed and so that souls may be set free from bondage. I pray that when people would not that when people would look at us, they would not see us as mean or as human, but when they would look at us, they would see Jesus Christ at work in us. And I pray, dear God, that as we train these leaders, we would be faithful in the gospel of Jesus Christ to preach the hope that we have, the hope of salvation from sin, the hope of a heart set free to serve the God who made us and loves us. I pray, dear God, that your will would be done and that you would take us, plain and simple as we may be, 
fill us with your Holy Spirit and equip us for every good work in Christ so that we might lift Jesus high and he might draw all the world unto himself to the glory of God our Father in heaven. Lord, we love you and we praise you. And we pray a special anointing upon the leaders in this conference and those being trained up for leaders that they would be faithful to the one who called them, even as you are faithful to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Stomp. As an annual conference, we voted that we would also focus on creating new and renewed congregations. A couple of months ago, when I got into my office, I, I got word that John Wilson was really excited about something. <laughs> now, those of you who know John know that he's a pretty low-key individual. Unlike some members of our staff, <laughs> John can be in the building and you don't even know that he's there. So when I heard that John was excited about something, I immediately asked what was going on. And, and Tina, my gem of an assistant, praise God for Tina Wilson. <laughs> Tina, Tina said to me, you need to hear from John yourself, Bishop. And so I asked John to come to my office. And when he came to my office, he was beaming. He was beaming as he shared with me that, that every time he goes to, to the meetings where the, all of the conference statisticians get together, every time he goes to those meetings, the General Commission on Finance and Administration makes a presentation regarding the data of the United Methodist Church. Yes, there, there are some people who actually look at and get excited about those statistics that you all <laughs> input every year. Now, now, when GCFA, the General Commission on Finance and Administration, make, makes these statistical presentations to the conference statisticians, usually they, they often uh, show statistical population trends, trends in population growth. But in the past, they've never included the stats from Western Pennsylvania. Because, you see, the the statistics in, in Western Pennsylvania have consistently shown over decades population decline. And, and so our data, unlike every other annual conference that shows some increase, our data has always shown a decrease and so they threw our data out because it skewed their report. Now, our decreasing population is not a surprise to any of you. I've heard the despair in your voices as you talked about how once thriving cities and towns in our annual conference are now struggling. And as young people, more and more young people are, are moving away in order to find jobs or, or, or to find the services that they need for their families. You, you share with me your fears about decreases in community populations and how those decreases have impacted our membership roles. Churches that were once thriving and full on Sunday mornings are now empty buildings where older members are struggling to sustain ministry. That's the despair. But let me tell you about the hope. I'll stand on my rock with a gleam in his eyes John told me that for the first time in decades the population growth data is projecting an increase in Western Pennsylvania Now, don't let me see your hope or joy. It's a real modest increase. <laughs> but the fact that there is no longer a steady decline is really significant. The trend is reversing. So look out, GCFA, you can't throw us out anymore. 
For the first time in decades, there now will be new people moving into our region. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. But even in advance of, of this shift, in population growth in our region, there are many churches around this annual conference that have been creatively and courageously creating new and renewed congregations. The Christar cluster of churches in the Seneca area of the Franklin District, they have a free skate every Sunday night. Sometimes there are as many as 300 people who attend this free skate, they're skating around to contemporary Christian music. Faith UMC in Fox Chapel has a ministry called Roots of Faith. Roots of Faith seeks to co connect people with God and one another irrespective of their ability level or their economic status. You heard about these rocks, and I hope you've seen these rocks. These painted rocks that have been around, they've been painted by and come courtesy of Faith UMC and Roots of Faith. You see, one of their ministries is to work with differently abled folks to paint positive messages on rocks. So as, as you are moving about the campus and you see a rock, it's okay. Bend down, pick it up and take it home with you. Because I want you to keep this rock as a reminder that it is on Christ the solid rock that we stand and that all other ground is sinking sand. Take this home with you to remind yourself of the hope that is ours through Jesus Christ. But I need to step off of my rock for a moment. and this is gonna be hard to hear. There's a significant place in our annual conference that we need to create a space for new people. The place is the senior pastorship of our large member churches, and the new people are our female clergy. Our cabinet, at the request of the Commission on the Status and Role of Women, looked at the data concerning clergy women in the denomination and in this annual conference. Although most of our pews are filled by women, only 23.2% only of the 1,047 clergy persons in this annual conference are female. Now that's slightly above the national average for clergy persons, where the average is about 28.4%. Now this data is disheartening, but even more disheartening is the fact that in Western Pennsylvania, the average salary of a full-time female serving in a pastoral role is 29.5% lower than full-time male pastors. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have some work to do toward equity and justice for our female pastors, and for that matter, for female deacons too. You ought to, you ought to say something. We, we still have, we still have, how many years has it been, 60 years? We still have staff parish relations committees that say they will not accept a female pastor. We even had a church that said they wouldn't accept the leadership of a female district superintendent. And unfortunately, some of our appointment practices have reinforced these injustices. But there is hope. 
We are moving toward greater equity in, in the numbers of persons who are being called to the ordained ministry as either elders or deacons. And our clergy women have recommitted to working together to support and uplift one another in ministry. And as your bishop, I will be holding clergy men accountable for preparing their pulpits for the next appointed pastor. regardless of the gender or race of that pastor. And I will hold accountable any pastor or any lay person in a position of leadership who preaches or teaches that women ought not be in the pulpit. I'm doing that because my hope isn't built on what you say about me being a woman. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Reverend Chris Kendall, would you please pray for us? Let us pray. Creator God, you have created everything that we see the great to the small, the beauty of creation, it reveals your presence. It brings us hope. It brings life. And Lord God, I can't stand here this morning without having to confess. Forgive us dear God, for our comfort. Mm. Forgive us for the comfort of longing for comfortable seats or air conditioning or the, the, the beautiful audio-visual capabilities that are out there. Mercy, mercy. And putting those above the people who are not yet in the church at all. Forgive us for thinking a, a beautiful building is more important mm. than the people who long to know Jesus, mm. Mercy. who long to know hope. Forgive us as we look at our female clergy members and we pay them differently. But Jesus, thank you for the hope that a new day is coming. That our hope is not in, um, in what we can do, but our hope is in what you are going to do. As we clothe ourselves in the, in the clothing of righteousness and love, that we leave our comfortable spaces we create new places for new people, Lord. We invigorate the places we currently have. And we do this all because we have hope and we want others to have that same hope. That we have that love and we want others to have that same love. And so here we are, dear Jesus. Please use us. Use us for this change. Use us for your kingdom. Set us forth. Empower us. Lead us. Guide us. Jesus, we pray all this in your precious name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. We have agreed as an annual conference that we're going to focus on ministry with the poor. And our regional ministries of Church Union, Connellsville Area Community Ministries, Erie United Methodist Alliance, and 
Johnstown Human Methodist Human, Johnstown United Methodist Human Services. Those organizations are doing phenomenal work. These are ministries that are successful by the grace of God and through the power of our connection. Through these and other cooperative ministries, diverse United Methodist churches are working together to meet the needs of the poorest and most marginalized persons in our communities. For example, Ramps of Hope in the Indiana District has built and installed ramps for over 200 homes. Now, some of our ministries need some, some volunteers. One of Church Union's ministries has been so successful, their, their reading program has been so successful that principals and administrators from out, throughout the Pittsburgh District are coming to them and saying, please come into our school to help our children learn to read. So they need some volunteers in the Pittsburgh area. So anybody here who feels a call to read to some youngsters, please contact Larry Haminsky or Paul Taylor or Dawn Hand if it's after June 30th at 12 midnight. <laughs> I was able, I was blessed to go and read with some of the kids and, and it fed my spirit, it fed my spirit. And some of you have expressed that, that these ministries, that they don't have enough money to con continue to, to go on, that they need some additional funding. funding. It is our current reality that it's going to become increasingly difficult to fund ministries merely through tithes and offerings. That's just a reality of where we are as a culture. But let me point to the hope. The hope that is in our churches that God has been breaking through. You see, there are churches in this annual conference who have been receiving grant money in order to, to fund their ministries. Grove Avenue United Methodist Church in the Moxham neighborhood in Johnstown received a grant to hire a staff person, a church and community worker. The worker will help to bridge the divide between the economically struggling neighborhood and the predominantly white middle-class churches in the community. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Donna, won't you pray for us? Heavenly Father, I ask that you would break our hearts for those things that break your heart. Father, I repent for the way that we turn our head, the way that we walk across the street when we see someone that is hurting or someone that doesn't look like us or smell like us. Father, I repent when we don't even share with our neighbor. I ask that you would come in power. Father, I ask now that you would give us your compassion that you would fill us with our compassion with your compassion and Lord that you would open our wallets and Father you have been so good to us we have abundance Father I ask that you would open our wallets, open our purses, that we would give extravagantly because we only get to keep what we give away. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would give us creative ways to reach out to the poor, the hurting, the broken. And Father, that we would never be afraid to embrace one that maybe doesn't smell so good. And Jesus, I thank you that you are more than able to use us for your glory. Psalm 41, 1 through 2 says, Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in the time of trouble. And I believe that is truth. As we press in, to give to the poor. God blesses us. 
Jesus again. Break our hearts for those who are poor and needy and orphaned. Break our hearts, Jesus. Amen. As a gathered body called the Western Pennsylvania Annual Conference, we voted that we would focus on abundant health. For decades, we've been doing good work to bring about abundant health across our globe. We helped to establish encounters with Christ in Latin America and the Caribbean, which provides funding for a number of, of health initiatives. We also founded the Nadiri Connection, which started as an organization to support United Methodist Mission in Nadiri, Zimbabwe, and now has expanded to support United Methodist healthcare facilities all over Zimbabwe. But while we have had success around the world, we, we struggle, we continue to struggle with health issues right here at home. Western Pennsylvania has one of the highest rates of opioid overdoses in the country. We are in despair as our young people and adults get caught up in this and other addictions. I've heard from many of you that, that you want to impact this epidemic in some way, but you, but you don't know what to do. Your, your conference staff, trying to resource ourselves so that we could lead. We participated in a, in a training from an organization called Sage's Army, which offers support and guidance and encouragement to those who have been affected by this spreading epidemic. Last week, first came, oh, next week, I'm sorry, first came UMC is hosting a speaker from, from Teen Challenge who will share with them information about the opioid crisis. The, the Kane District is, is planning a regional workshop to discuss ministry strategies to address this academic. But there is even more hope. And I, I need to stand on my rock for this one. Because you see, I have witnessed myself the power, the transformative power of the Holy Spirit in healing the sick and freeing those who are in bondage to addiction. Let, let me tell you a story about, about Ashes to Life in the Butler District. Old Otterbein UMC in Beaver Falls was, was dying, and then their building caught on fire. And, and so they had to find new places, a, a new place to worship. And in the midst of that, that new reality, the members of the congregation realized that in order to, to make disciples of Jesus Christ in a faithful way, they had to do some things differently. And so around, around that same time, God was, was moving in the hearts of persons who were, who were meeting, who were part of the Crossroads to Recovery Ministry. It's a ministry that, that helps folks who are healing, helps them find healing and freedom from whatever issues they may be facing. The members of Crossroads of Recovery felt God calling them to, to be a part of a local church, a part of a church that ministered healing to the addicted and to the abused. So the members of Old Audubon, they took a, a leap of faith. They took a leap of faith and, and they embraced a new way of doing ministry and they welcomed Crossroads to Recovery to be a part of them. And a new church, Ashes to Life United Methodist Church, was born. Instead of organizing around programs, Ashes to Life organizes around a community of, of small groups. As William Temple once said, that the church is the only organization that exists for its non-members. So the ministries of Ashes to Life are oriented. They orient them to those who are outside of the church. The church was dying. And they changed their focus. And from the ashes, God has used them to, to bring new life to those in the community who were dying. I had the blessing of meeting one of those persons. Her name is Janice Olson. She was dying from the disease of addiction, but, but something, something, we Methodists would call it provenient grace, something drew her to the church. And, and she started to attend Ashes to Life, but when she started to attend, she was still addicted, actively. 
But she said to me, she said to me, the members of that church loved her unconditionally. She told me that the church loved her until she, through Jesus Christ, learned to love herself. Now, Janice is sober, and Janice is a leader in that church. Not only is she a leader, but she is an evangelist in the community. She's an evangelist. She is speaking out about the saving and healing power of Jesus the Christ. Janice is one example of why I have hope and I can stand on this rock. Another example came about when I attended the Pittsburgh Pastoral Care Conference. Um, this is a, an ecumenical organization, and when I went there to, to speak, they surprised me by asking me to present an award, award on their behalf to a United Methodist Church. They had chosen to give Reverend Matt Price and Gus Dorena of Fairhaven United Methodist Church the Dave Ellis Award because of the work that they have been doing in the area of addictions. Now, Gus Dorena has his own story about how he went to a United Methodist Church in Susquehanna Annual Conference and how there the women of that church loved him and trusted him. And so through them, he experienced the love of Christ and was able to gain victory over his addiction. Janice Olson and Gus Durena, new to our fold, have agreed to lead a task force which will help us as an annual conference identify and provide resources to you, those of you who are on the ground, so that you can impact this epidemic in Western Pennsylvania. So as I stand on this rock, I declare in the name of Jesus, that the Western Pennsylvania Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church will make an impact on the opioid epidemic in Western Pennsylvania. I declare it in the name of Jesus. Somebody ought to say hallelujah. Somebody ought to praise God to seal the declaration of what God is going to do through us. On this rock, there is hope. But we still struggle. Our clergy in this annual conference still struggle. They struggle with heart disease, diabetes, cancer. Those things impact them at greater proportions than they do the general population. Clergy, brothers and sisters, we've got to take better care of ourselves. And laity, I need you to help. I need you to hold your, your pastors accountable, accountable to take at just one day, one day a week where they don't answer any church calls or read any church email one day a week. It's a spiritual discipline that was commanded us by God. Amen. And y'all got to pray for your bishop to do the same. because I'm tired of hearing from my husband and from Tina. <laughs> but I do have some hope. Since, since we met last in this gathering, I've lost 20 pounds. <laughs> and 
I continue to, to recommit myself to, to exercising at least three times a week, no matter what time I get home at night, getting on the treadmill, because my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Jay, you're going to pray. Jesus, we know physical health and spiritual health are connected. If our spirits are heavy or anxious, our bodies feel it. And if we are ill or injured, we can become spiritually ill, depressed or angry or distant from God. Jesus, we repent of how we have treated our own bodies, whether by the food we eat or the exercise we do or don't do, whether we make it an idol or, or something we ignore out of your commandments to be fit for the temple of the Holy Spirit and fit for ministry. Help us, Lord, to also minister to the spiritual and emotional needs that feed the addictions to food and drugs and despair. In Matthew 4, 23, Jesus, it says, you went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every aff affliction. We must do the same for the sake of the kingdom and for the sake of the people. Help us, O oh Lord. We pray for your anointing on the abundant health of our church and our world. You brought the gospel and healing together, one as a sign of the other. We pray now for your abundant healing throughout the earth, breaking spiritual and physical bondages. Give strategic wisdom to the leaders of these efforts to break the cycles of poverty and illness, to provide clean water and health care and education and freedom. We pray for life and hope and healing and to see your children around the world thrive in health and wholeness. Amen. So you got one more area of focus. Anybody know what it is? Praise God, dismantling racism, yay. Now, shortly after it was announced that I was being assigned to the Western Pennsylvania Annual Conference, I met with the delegation from this conference to, to hear their hopes and dreams for the future. One of the hopes was that, that I would help to, to lead us to be more racially diverse as an annual conference. At that time, in 2016, based on the statistics that you reported to the General Church, our annual conference was 98% white. That's in contrast to the geographic region around us that is 85% white. Today, of our over 1,000 clergy persons, only 15 of them are racial ethnic clergy. Of our over 800 congregations, five of them predominantly African-American, one is Hispanic, and we have four multi-ethnic communities. These statistics are troubling. At that, that 2016 jurisdictional conference, the delegates that were there passed a resolution which called to action the College of Bishops, the NEJ Vision Table, table the Multi-Ethnic Center, and each annual conference called them to action in efforts to confront racism in the United Methodist Church. At my request, Reverend Diane Glave, who's the staff person for diversity, development, and inclusion, engaged every, level, every conference level committee and agency and, and group that we have in a process of, of discerning our hopes and dreams for how God would have us to respond to the call to action. I urge you to read that call to action in its entirety. It can be found on page 201 in your pre-conference booklet. I urge you to read it in its entirety because I'm gonna ask you to affirm it later on in the week and because you need to know the hopes and dreams of your leaders and what we're gonna be working on to combat racism. Now, we did an assessment of, of where we are as an organization in becoming a multicultural organization. It, it, the assessment that we did is based on the Crossroads Anti-Racism Organizing and Training Continuum on becoming an anti-racist, multicultural institution. On that assessment, we received a 
2.5 on a scale of one to six, with one being an exclusive institution and six being a fully inclusive institution. We are somewhere between being passive about issues of dismantling racism and instituting only symbolic change in order to become a multicultural institution. This is troubling. Our numbers are discouraging. But you know what? My hope isn't built on numbers. You know what? My hope is built on the fact that when Jesus got up out of that grave, Jesus proved that Jesus has power even to combat racism in the Western Pennsylvania Annual Conference. Amen? Let me tell you about the places where I've seen God breaking through some of the signs of hope that we have. Our conference staff recently participated in a microaggression training. We wanted to know what, what are the signs that we're giving to say to minorities that, that they're not welcomed among us. During this training, we learned about some of the statements that we make that are, are sometimes motivated, motivated by white privilege and are often perceived as racist and aggressive by people of color. Now, equally important to the training, we agreed as a staff to stay engaged in conversation so that we might learn from, from one another, learn those things that, that we might say or do that signal to others or that are perceived by racial minorities as offensive and therefore are not welcoming. I'm, I'm so godly proud to say that uh, on July 1st, we're gonna increase our racial ethnic clergy ranks by two. <laughs> and, and we're in the process of negotiating for another one, so pray hard. You've got a pulpit to fulfill. As a cabinet, we've developed a more comprehensive process for preparing pastors and congregations for cross-racial appointments. Through our clergy excellence ministry led by Susan Modre, this year we will hire three interns who are persons of color, praise God. And one of them is here. Oh, he just stepped out to go to the restroom. Sorry, he missed his big moment of fame. Uh, Tracy Cox, you all know her or at least her family. She is, is working as an intern with our camping and retreat ministry this summer to, to help set up four day camps in communities with diverse populations. In the camping and retreat ministry report, you will hear about how we're gonna be blessed by, by the racial diversity of the Healthy Village Living Initiative. We've also been blessed because some of our youth have been leading workshops on cultural sensitivity and, and on dismantling racism. During Lent, we had five congregations who participated in, in multi-ethnic conversations through our Office of Congregational Development and Revitalization. Congregations across our annual conference are engaging in, in vital conversations about race, culture, and justice. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Sharon, Gregory, Richard, won't you come and pray for us? Would you pray? Holy God, we acknowledge that um, based only on the color of our skin, some of us have experienced favor, but others of us have experienced rejection. Holy God, we confess that here, even in this very room, brothers and sisters of color endure rejection on an ongoing, even daily basis. And we grieve for this. Lord Jesus, we acknowledge that as this issue has continued to haunt us decade after decade after decade, we have at times grown apathetic. And we ask that you would forgive us. We ask that you would renew the fire within our hearts to be your voice, to be your truth just as John Wesley spoke 
in his very final days, exhorting us to address the freedom of the slaves. We ask that you would restore that passion within us to match the passion that you have, that we would be one, that we would see one another as the gifts that you have made for one another. As we move to see one another as the gifts that you have made us within our body, we acknowledge the call that we have in our homes, in our churches, in our nations to speak your truth, to be your heart and voice. Great creator, you've heard the cry. We are asking for you to help us. We have talked, yes, we have talked, but now it is the action. So we have asked, we are praying to light that fire and to light that fire with action, action to bring us together, to have us to have those uncomfortable conversations, those conversations that will take us to the level of being together, of being the brothers and sisters in Christ of who we are. We are God's children. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And we must begin to look at one another in love in respect and as human beings, not objects, not objects. The time is now, right now, and let us all stand on that solid rock and make a difference through our actions. A-C-T-I-O-N, U-N-I-T-Y, N. L O V E. Amen. 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 It's been almost two years and I'm still smiling. <laughs> and some of you are still smiling too. So I hope that you are ready to stand in hope, sharing in the glory of God. I hope that you brought with you to this annual conference your best WPA chic clothing so that you will be dressed in hope throughout the rest of this week. Because if we dress in anything other than hope, then we will belie our Christian witness. And as your bishop, I'm just not going to have that. As an annual conference, I am convinced that we have been called to something unique in our denomination. As an annual conference, I'm convinced that in the midst of our diversity, we have been called to be hope and light for this denomination and for the world. And so in order to fulfill our call, we're going to have to dress appropriately. We're going to have to have some hope. And so I hope that you believe in Jesus the Christ. I, I hope that you believe that when he was on this earth, that he walked here without sin. I hope that you believe that while he was here, that he and the Father were one, and in that oneness, they were able to perform miracles. It's just a sign, the bird is just a sign. <laughs> it's just a sign, the bird is just a sign. <laughs> I hope that you believe that after they crucified, 
and they buried our Savior. That on the third day, he got up again. And I hope you believe that one day he is going to come back again and bring salvation throughout the creation. I hope you believe, because you got to have something to stand on. I hope you believe, because the world out there is telling us we ought to have no hope. I hope you believe, because there's a rock for you. And there is work for us to do, to be the light. In Jesus' name. Amen.